Um, well, my name is Eric Michael Gillette, and um, I've been a, a working member, a working professional, gosh, since I got out of high school, pretty much. Um, I went to school to be a teacher and discovered I didn't want to do it. And it, as it happens, I was being offered work at the time, so I started acting and pursuing it. Um, in the early days of my career, it was, you know, the standard stuff that you do when you're a non-union actor, you know, um, dinner theater, um, a little bit of stock, things like that, um, touring with uh, singing groups, anything to, to make a buck and to keep myself in front of people. Then um, I lucked into something in the uh, middle of my 20s. I went to a, uh, an audition in Las Vegas for a job, and I ended up booking it, and I ended up working in Las Vegas as a production singer for, I guess, the first time I was there, it was for two years, and then I came back as the star of a, of a production show, and I did that for two and a half or three years. But during that time, I never stopped um, coming to Los Angeles and training. Um, I worked with Gordon Hunt, who is Helen Hunt, the Academy Award-winning actress's father, and she was actually in class with us then. She was like 13 or 14, I think. Um, a lot of big people came out of that class, Johnny Banks, people like that. And it was through Gordon that I met uh, a woman named Terry Ralston. Uh, we used to do an exercise in a class called Resume, and you basically had to talk about yourself and what you had done in your career and what your hopes were. And in this one class, I mentioned that I was still non-union. And that summer, I got a call from Terry Ralston, who offered me my union card to go and do a production of Side by Side by Sondheim in uh, Detroit. So that got me my card and got me started in, uh, with the ability to go back into auditioning for theater in a real way. I did Vegas, and then I did uh, I toured with a couple of big shows and did a lot of uh, Los Angeles theater and also regional and then um, in 1986, I got hired by Ringing Brothers Circus, and I went out as the ringmaster of Ringing Brothers Circus for 12 years. That's cool. <laughs> um, but I never lost the thing that I wanted to be, which was to be a, you know, an actor in New York. And so while I was doing the touring, I would come back and forth to New York, and I met people anywhere I could. I started singing in cabarets because it was something I could do on the one day a week that I had off. And I met a lot of people because of it including the first agent that I got when I moved here. And I moved here, um, basically I quit the circus because I, I went, if I don't do it now, I won't go do it. And I really want to do a Broadway show. So I got here, booked my first Broadway show right after I got here, and um, just never looked back. I've done uh, three original cast Broadway shows. I don't even know how many off-Broadway shows. Um, I've been a principal singer at New York City Ballet and at New York City Opera. I know that's weird, a singer at New York City Ballet, but it's, it's a job. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Um, and uh, I would say about 10 years ago, I became more interested in, I had always done some film and television, but I became more interested in pursuing it. So I changed representation to people who were more focused on that and began pursuing almost exclusively TV and film, and that's what I've been doing since. Uh, I think the most recent thing I did, I just shot with Russell Crowe, I shot a, a new Showtime series called The Loudest Voice that's going to start airing in June, late June, and I play uh, Paul Manafort in the last episode. Nice. Cool. Um, um, how did I achieve this? Well, I mean, before before you even do that, uh, if you had to narrow it down, like, what would you say were your two like biggest accomplishments that you're most proud of, and then how did you achieve those? I would say getting my first Broadway show mm -hmm. because it was the um, culmination of a lot of advanced planning and thinking and strategizing. Um, look, I came to New York pretty fairly late in the middle of my career, and um, it's, they, they auditioned everybody in the city to be in that revival of Kiss Me Kate that I did, and I, I used to say to people, you know, it's, I don't think that I could possibly have been the absolute best baritone that they heard, but <laughs> I positioned myself so that the production team wanted me. Um, I met Vinny Liff from Johnson Lip out in California. I went to an audition for something that he was casting that I knew I was wrong for, but I used a friend, I networked, I had a friend who was going to be playing the audition, and he said, if you show 
show up and send a note. I'll make sure they hear you. Um, I got in to sing for Vinny, and uh, he championed me when I was still on the road with the circuit, as did Jay Bender. And then when I finally moved here, I targeted uh, Tara Rubin, who at the time was an associate at Jonathan Lip. And I said, you know, if I can just get in front of her a few times and show her what I can do, I think that that might tip the scales in my favor. And um, sure enough, by the end of the classes that I took with her, my agents had turned down an audition from her, and they had said it was because they didn't want me to go out of town. They wanted me to stay because I, they really wanted me to get a Broadway show my first season. And Tara surprised, surprised me by agreeing with them and said, we've got two new shows coming in, and I think Eric Michael should be seen for both, and he should book one. And um, that's exactly what happened. I auditioned for Kate in, like, March. All I did was sing. I never had another call back. I assumed that it had gone on its own merry way. And about two months later, I got a call saying they want to um, see you, uh, I think on Tuesday it was, and it turned out that was the final. And about a week later, they cast me. That's so awesome. The reason I'm proud of it is, a, the odds were against me. I was the, I was one of the older people in the show, but I was also the only Broadway debut in that company, and I literally planned how to get that show. From the first time that I talked to my friend Jerry about singing for Vinny out in Los Angeles, to taking these classes with Kara and getting to know her and getting. Uh, getting her support as a, as a casting director and uh, later as a colleague. In fact, Tara ended up being responsible for my for one of my other Broadway shows and for booking me on the movie of the producers as well. Um, but actually, that was one of the major ones. And the other was, um, if I had to pick something, I would say it was booking my first recurring on, uh, on a series and getting to play... Uh, Gregory Tepper, Dr. Tepper, in uh, Marvel Daredevil in season two, because it was it was one of those jobs where you didn't have a clue as to what the scene was about or how to give them what they wanted, because there was a whole you know non disclosure agreement and they didn't give you very much of the script. So when I booked it, I did not even know that the role recurred. I am proud to say that I am dead in the Marvel Universe and I actually have a little page um, in the, out there on the internet somewhere that tells you all about my character and who I was and how I died. <laughs> That's cool. Well, you know, it's funny that that credit has booked me a lot of work. You'd be surprised at how many people love that series and when they see the scene work from it, they go, oh, we want to meet this guy. So that was a, that was a major break for me. And when did you say that one happened? Oh, gosh, let's see. This season was Loudest Voice. Um, that season was Quantico. Before that, I would say it's five years ago now, four or five years ago. Cool. Um, I have just a side question on the uh, Broadway thing uh, that I had written. And that was, you mentioned that you sort of like positioned yourself in such a way that the production team would want you. Um can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Like if someone, if an actor were thinking like, oh, I'd like to be able to position myself so a production team wants to bring me on, um, what would be your thought or suggestion for something like that? Well, the, the first, the, the way that I believe it's worked for me, and of course, you know, everybody who's involved in the casting process has their own thinking, their own thoughts, but I was, I was, by the time I moved here, Vinny Lip already knew who I was and liked my work and wanted me to get a Johnson Lip show. In fact, at the opening night party for Kate, um, rest his soul, he actually came up to me and he said, you know, I wanted you to make your Broadway debut in a Johnson Lip show and you are in the Godiva chocolate of Johnson Lip shows. And I was very touched by that. Hmm. But even so, I mean, you know, there's a million actors that they see so the second step that I used, well, I did two things. The first one was I was performing in the city whenever I could while I was on the road with the circus. And so I was doing a, a, a gig at the Algonquin in the Oak Room, and my singing partner was represented by an agency, and I asked her to invite them. And so they liked what they saw. 
because uh, she and I were singing together, so they came for her. But they liked what they saw, and they um, told me that when I moved to the city to call them. And so I came to the city already set um, to meet with an agent that was interested already. I think when I first got here, it took about two, three months to set up the meeting. And so I, uh, I freelanced with a, a fellow named Michael Hardick, who was a lovely man. Um, but as a freelancer, you know, you're not going to get into the rooms that you want to get into because he's, he's servicing a lot of people and he's got to service his contract people first. But once I met with, uh, with the agents that I was with at that time, um, that gave me uh, credibility in the Broadway market. So even though I didn't have any Broadway credit, they were able to, they used the circus angle and they used the knowledge that Vinny and Jay Binder both knew who I was already. It's that question that agents always ask, you know, who do you know so that we don't have to beat on the door to get you in the room? And I was able to say, well, Vinny Lift knows me, and Jay Binder has met me and has liked me and brought me in. So they targeted those two offices from their end. And then I went through, I went to something that, was, that Backstage used to do, a big actor fest. And while I was there, I met uh, what I, I guess you'd call her an advisor from um, a company called TVI. And uh, we were talking about classes and the thing that she said that I was impressed with, she said, you know, if you come in and meet with me, I think I would like to suggest to you people you should meet who tend to bring people in. And one of the people that she mentioned was Tara. And I said, well, it's interesting because I'm targeting Tara because she's been his associate. So that was actually the first class I ever took at TVI. And that one class, um, which was about four weeks long, and I have to tell you honestly, that one class paid for, that class ended up paying for every class I've ever taken in my life because it was responsible for, like I say, two Broadway shows and a movie. Um, but it was really about, once they got interested in me, about making sure that Tara knew that I had the goods for the kind of show that she'd be submitting me for. They Kiss Me Kate, the special animal, it's a golden age musical, um, it has legit singing for the for the ensemble and the smaller character roles, but it's really a very specific kind of Broadway belt that they want also. And so I made sure that I had, had targeted the kind of music that they would want to hear. Um, I made sure that I was as clear about the song that I chose, that it showed off both me vocally, but also the energy that I had, uh, you know, my particular personal performer's energy, and um, when I sang, it was for Paul Gimignani. And um, I didn't sing really. I didn't, it wasn't a high song. I purposely chose something that only took me up to about an F sharp. Uh, because I felt that somebody as sharp as Paul Gimignani, if he couldn't tell how high I could sing based off of that, then I wasn't showing him what he wanted to hear anyway. And sure enough, when I was leaving the room, he said, you know, do you have a B flat? And I, I laughed and I said, well, actually, I have a B. It's on my resume. He just laughed at me and he said, well, I just wanted to know if you would own it. <laughs> but I'm, I was very confident about what I was doing and that if, if it wasn't going to go my way, it wasn't because I wasn't prepared. And um, it's, it's actually funny because when I got the call back, I was given some sides, some Shakespearean sides for Baptista. Uh, who plays Kate's father, who is Kate's father in The Taming of the Shrew. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and I said, you know, I, I gosh, now i got to go and read Taming of the Shrew, and I'm going to have to go back and take a look at the material, all the material, and kiss me Kate again, just make sure I know what I'm doing. And she sort of laughed at me, and she said, you know, they just want to cuff a character. Just go in and just, you know, just wow them with your, you know, with your razzle-dazzle. And I said, you know, that might work for you, but if I do that, I won't feel and so I, I literally did. I went back. I read. I read all of Taming of the Shrew. I watched um, the Franco Zeffirelli version of it, just to get a sense of the language because it wasn't. I don't do Shakespeare all that often, so I wanted to remind myself of what the cadences were. And I kept the same song that I had sung the first time, and I wore the same clothes that I had worn the first time. And I went in, and um, Benny lived came out to before I went in, he said, I just want to warn you, there's like 50 people in there. And again, you have to understand, I thought it was just a simple first callback. And I said, why are there so many people here? And he said, well, this is the finals. Didn't anybody tell you? I laughed at it. No. 
<laughs> so I went in, did my thing. Um, Mr. Blakemore, our director, um, asked me to read Baptiste after I sang. And then the only thing that they threw at me, um, Gemignani, when, when they said, everybody said, you know, does anybody need anything else? And Gemignani said, can you sing your song again, but up a third? And I've never forgotten this because, you know, when you're doing a Broadway belt, you have to think about the math. Like, a third up, is that a covered note or can I belt that? And before I had a chance, this was fortuitous. There's a guy named Larry Yerman who was, was playing those auditions. And he's gone on, he was he conducted on 30 Modern Millie, he was musical director of Grey Gardens and the Happiness at the Lincoln Center. He's a fantastic guy. But Larry was at the piano and he mouthed to me, you can do it. And just started my music. He didn't give me any time to think. And I just, okay, if, if he says I can do it, I can do it. And I opened my mouth and I belted out whatever the high note was. I think it was an A. And I got finished and Jim, Jim and Yanni looked at everybody else in the room like, I've seen what I need to see. And that was the end of the audition. <laughs> um, it, it was really about making sure that you were showing them exactly the energy that they wanted for that style of show. The, the, the counter to that, my second show was a show called Sweet Smell of Success. And there was a role I was interested in. Um, and the casting director was not someone who was a fan of my work at the time, but I knew John Ware from Kiss Me Kate, and I knew Craig Carnelia, who was a colleague. So between them, I pushed to get an audition, and I got in the room. And Craig gave me some insights into the character, and they really saw the character as a kind of a Danny DeVito type and really a slob. So literally, before going in for the audition, I slept in my clothes for two or three days. I ate in them. If food got on them, I didn't clean it off. I didn't shave the day of the audition. And I just was as seedy as you could possibly be. The exact opposite of Kiss Me Kate. <laughs> and um, but once I booked the role, I realized that I didn't see the character the way that they saw it. I saw him as an almost skeletal version of John... Uh, John Lithgow's character, J.J. Hunsecker, sort of a, uh, a J.J. wannabe. And I was able to convince uh, our director that what I saw in it might be more interesting to make him a, just a little more piss elegant, but on the seedier side of it. And so I lost a lot of weight. I changed the way I looked for it. But it all began with making sure that they could see that I could do the thing that they were looking for, the, the Danny DeVito thing. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just, you know, listening, you, you're always taking in information and listening to it and trying to figure out what exactly, the, what I used to tell students was, when you go into a room and they tell you you nailed something, they just mean that you gave them everything that they know that they want. And I guess the thing I tell people to try to bring into the room is the thing they don't know they want until they see it. And sometimes it's just, you know, Knowing, doing your research on it. I did a film that I knew the director worked comedy a lot and he did a lot of improv work and I did my audition and they said I nailed it. They said that the first time. And I said, is there anything else you'd like to see? And um, the director said, well, you know, do you have another choice? And I said, well, no, I, I don't have another choice for the scene. But I said, but I could improv the scene if you would like. And you could almost see the relief on his face that someone was willing to play. And I did like a like a four or five minute riff on a on a two or three minute scene. And at the end of the day, that's what got me the job. Yeah. Because it made him feel that he could let me off the leash, you know, when we were on set with major stars. So it, sometimes it's just doing the research in advance and making sure that you know, you know, this is the world you're going to be, not just the world of the show, but this is the world of the people that you're going to be associating with. They're going to have certain needs and you want to let them know that you're open to that and that you can deliver that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, all right. So that was all really uh, good stuff and uh, some really good tips in there. I like that. Um, in terms of like, you know, regular marketing or promoting yourself, uh, are there certain things that you have a habit of doing on a daily or weekly or monthly basis in order to uh, book paid acting work? And the tell that I do. Yeah, and tell a little bit about them and how they've contributed to moving your career forward. Um, 
there are two schools of thought about you know postcarding people and stuff like that. The first the first rule of marketing and that I follow very closely is make sure you know that how the people that you're contacting like to be contacted. There are people who absolutely hate email. There are other people who absolutely do. They are they do not want postcards and letters coming to them. Email them is the only way. I have a list that I keep updated all the time of any casting person or director or creative that I have worked with, when I saw them last, um, what the work experience was like, you know, do I feel comfortable with them enough to call them or is it somebody that I just sort of Facebook know? Um, I would say on a daily basis, I do submissions. On a weekly basis, I try to reach out to anywhere from three to five people that I haven't seen in at least a year, um, even to touch base or to set up, you know, coffee or a drink or something. And sometimes it's just a fellow actor. Sometimes it's the director of a show. Um, sometimes it's a producer that I've worked with. I try to be, I try not to chase down casting people um, as much as I might have when I was younger. I tend to write to casting only when I have something to say, like for instance, I'll be doing a mailing, and an emailing and a regular standard mailing, um, probably in the next, I would say two to three weeks, in order to tell people about the loudest voice. And then I'll do another mailing in July because I'm supposed to go off and do a production of Cabaret, so I'll let people know I'm going away, and then I'll send production photos and if there are any reviews, you know, a, a quote or something, to let people know I'm back in town. And the reason that that pays off is that, as an example, there's a casting director that I had not seen in a while, and I was sort of perusing the breakdowns this one morning when I had just returned from a job, and I saw that she was casting some projects. So I thought, well, what could it hurt? I guess this was late at night, now that I think of it. And I sent her a note saying, hey, I'm back in town. Uh, here's a photo of me playing Andrew White in Sleuth. You know, it was really fun. Had a blast, you know back in town, pounding the pavement, you know, if anything comes up that I'm right for, I hope you'll think of me, knowing full well that she had something that was right. And it was 7 o'clock the next morning, and I actually got a phone call from her saying, can you be at an audition today if I send you the material now? And I went to the audition, and I, I actually, it's the only time that ever happened to me, I booked it in the room. They gave me the script while I was there. <laughs> and that same casting director, because I was then on her radar, brought me in two weeks later for an off-Broadway show, that um, ran for like five or six months, and I booked that as well. And I was, I hadn't been on her radar in forever. And I, I tell this to people because that part of the business has not changed in 40 some odd years. My first ever audition for a pilot for a television show was at MTM Productions, and it was for uh, a TV show called Father Murphy. And I had a lousy agent in California. She was a lovely lady, but a bad agent. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a, a little solo cabaret evening, and I sent postcards out to all the casting offices about it. And out of no place, I get this phone call to bring me in for an audition. And I get the sides, and I look at them, and I go in, and I read. And at the end of it, she says, that was terrific. I'm, I'm going to have you back to read for the for the director and producers. And, and she says, and if that goes well, she says, then we're going to take you to network as well. I said, I just have one question. I said... I'm just curious. I said, how did you happen to find me? And she said, oh my God. She says, your postcard came across my desk on the day I was casting this. And she pointed to her bulletin board and there was my postcard on her bulletin board. <laughs> and then she said, and then that afternoon, the, that fantastic review that you got in Variety came out. Now, I had to tell you something. I did not get a fantastic review in Variety. It was middling at best. But what she saw was my name in bold face print in Variety. <laughs> and that literally got me on the MTM lot and into an audition for a top casting director. So it, it is, you know, people laugh and say like, well, that doesn't really happen. But yes, it does. People see your face. They need to be jogged periodically. And sometimes it's like, it's like throwing dust into the wind. You never know if any of it can even blow back your way. But once in a while, something lands that you're not expecting. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, that's a that's an amazing story that I think that actors will be 
really, really uh, interested to, to hear about. Um, just like, you know, people say like, oh, the, so much of it is luck, you know, but it's like, well, I mean, you did the promotion stuff consistently that it enabled the luck to actually happen. And most actors right. don't even do mailings like you do and they don't reach out to people. And so, you know, part of this program that I'm hoping to do is to actually teach actors ways of systematizing it so they don't have to like, you know, constantly be spending all their time doing it, but so that it actually still gets done, you know. Well, it's interesting to me that, like I say, the, the thing that's interesting about that particular story is that the same thing that got me jobs in 2007 or eight with Stephanie is the exact same thing that got me seen for my very first pilot back in the 70s. And it's just my face going across the desk at the right moment. Mm-hmm. And that's what people underestimate. And you don't even have to be writing to them for a submission. People think, well, I'll just submit. But sometimes it's just like you drop a note to somebody and say, you know, I, uh, I, I, I'm i taking a class with somebody at Playwright to Rise shortly. And I've taken from her before. I love her teaching. I think she's great. Um, I'm writing her a note in about a week because she's got something coming up that I'm interested in. But I'm going to let her know, you know, I'm coming back to take class with you in just next month. And I'll also just, you know, by the way, the week after the class, my new TV thing starts to air, and I hope you'll catch it when my episode's up. When I, by the time I get into the class, that will have already crossed us. Yeah. She'll already have a different, you know, not a different view of me because she likes my work, but I'll already be in a slightly different category because, oh, he's working opposite Russell Crowe in a scene in a TV set. That, anytime you can say that you're doing something like that, it's not that Every actor is a challenge to work with. Every actor is someone you want to collaborate with. But people have to believe that you can hold your own against the big boys. Yeah. I mean... And if they... Then they trust you. Mm-hmm. It's very... It sounds very strategic, your way of promoting yourself, because it's kind of like you're thinking three steps ahead rather than just being like, oh, I'm going to do a mass mailing right now. It's like, okay, well, I know that this thing is coming up and this person that I know is involved with it. So how can I line things up so that it, you know, makes me more likely to be uh, reached out to when the time is right? Right. And, and sometimes it's just like, you know, like if a casting person that you've met, I'm going to use casting people, but you, you could apply this to agents as well, um, or any creative. But if a casting person likes your work, they've hired you before, for instance, or when you've taken a class with them, they're consistently um, abusive in their praise, even if they don't bring you in all the time. Um, those are the people that you want to keep cultivating. The ones who don't respond to you, I put those, I have a way of prioritizing that. It's like, if you don't respond to me or you seem like you're looking for things not to like, you're not at the top of my list of people that I need to court. Not because I feel like I can't win you over, but because there's so many people out there who do want to meet you. Why am I going to bat my head against the door here that wants to stay closed? Amazing. And then in time, that door will open up its own accord. Yeah, and that's genius. I, I love it. <laughs> there, was an, there was an actress that I knew, um, and this is something you should tell your people. She would audition and audition and audition and audition, and I would ask her, how did it go? And she'd be like, oh, they loved me, it was great, but she never got any callbacks, and she never booked any work. And one day, she was, you know, she was like anybody else. She was depressed about it, and we were talking, and I said, well, I'm just curious. You always get this great response, and they all seem to know you. Why do you think nobody calls you in? Because I know she's talented, right? And she said, I just don't know. And I said, well, I'm going to just suggest them you and I, I'm probably wrong but what the hell they can use it or not I said I think maybe you've become damaged goods I think they've seen you for a couple three years they like you you're pleasant but they've never booked you it's somewhere in there they've started to qualify you as an also ran as what well, what do I do as an also ran you know yeah she's nice and I love her but we're not going to bring her back mm -hmm. so what I suggested was I said I think you just need to not go to see those people for a while I think you should go find casting directors who don't know you and see what happens. Well, she went out almost immediately thereafter and she booked um, the Philadelphia company of menopause. She went down to Philadelphia. She was probably there for six to nine months, whatever. Her first audition when she came back, 
she went in for a major office that had always been very nice to her at EPAs, but had never called her back. She walked in, and the first thing out of the girl's mouth was, oh, my God, I haven't seen you in forever. What have you been up to? And she said, well, I just returned from Philadelphia. I was there for nine months, starring in menopause, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's incredible. I'm so happy for you. And, of course, that day she got a call back. <laughs> There's something about people perceiving that you don't need something from them and that you're successful anyway and that makes people view you in a different light. And that's why where I came up with the idea that, you know, if, someone's, if someone doesn't, doesn't respond to your work, uh, there's a casting director in town I who will remain nameless, but um, I remember trying to get seen for something, and my agents tried, the, the company manager um, talked to them about me, uh, one of the stars of the show talked to them about me, and a couple of people were very interested, but the casting director called my agent and said, stop pushing him, I don't know him and I don't have to. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll never audition for him again, I have no, I have no need to do that to myself. Yeah. And the crazy thing was, was that I had final on two Broadway shows that this guy had cast, and he still was willfully unwilling to connect with me. So I went, well, then why would I want to pursue him? Go pursue the people who are interested. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, I feel like just in general, you know, um, people have this sense of like, oh, I need to, you know, hello? Uh-oh. We lost the call. Let's call back. There you are. Hey, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Um, um, no, I, I was just saying that, you know, a lot of people, they don't understand how many opportunities there are out there. And so it can kind of sometimes feel like, uh, you know, I don't want to like close any of my chances. But in reality, there's so many people out there and there's new casting directors and new agents coming in like every year. There's hundreds of new people joining the industry. So there's like virtually unlimited opportunities. And if something isn't working out with the people that you're currently seeing or working with or doing most of your work for, then you try moving on or try pursuing other ones. Yeah, I just think that at a certain point in time, that if you're if you're going to spend time marketing, market put your put your marketing money where it can do you some good. Meaning, put your marketing toward the people who, when you meet them, express interest in you. You know, if somebody really compliments my work in a class, and then if I look at the video afterwards and I say like, "Yeah, that was that was really good." They, I see, and I see the adjustment; it came out really well. I'll write and thank them. I don't, I don't write to casting people after I meet them in the class and just say, thanks for the great class. But if I see something profound, I'll write and I'll say, thanks, that was really an amazing adjustment. I got to see the video and it did make a difference and I'm, I'm very pleased. I hope we run into each other. And then I leave them alone for like six months. And after about six months, I'll take their class again. And if the response is the same, then I'll put them on the list of people that I want to pursue. Mm, interesting. Another thing that I think people don't do in terms of how they market themselves is they target only one person in an office. And I have a client of mine who right now, she, what she says, she's on the um, Tucker Meyerson trail. She's, if she can get into a room where anybody from that office, assistant, associate, um, or Tucker Meyerson, um, she takes that class so that the entire office knows who she is. And I think ultimately that's a very smart strategy for an actor because you can scattershot yourself with a million different casting people. And let's say you meet, um, let's say you meet a casting associate from some office and they like your work, but they're never assigned to the projects that you would be interested in working on. So your stuff isn't going. Is, is she? You're not going to be on the radar for these things. Then let's say you're on the radar with the one of the a friend told me recently. She said. Wow, you know, she said, I don't know why we didn't think of you for this. And I said, I can tell you why. I said, because you're the name on the door and you know me, but your assistants open all of the mail. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the, the face of the business. If you stop and think that when I moved to New York, the big offices were um, Hughes Moss, um, Johnson Lip, Jay Bender, um, maybe one or two other big ones. Now, 
the Binder office is no longer what it was. It's a totally different kind of office. We've taken over by somebody else. Johnson Lift doesn't exist. Tara Rubin is, uh, is a huge office. Kelsey's office is gigantic. Hughes Moss doesn't exist, you know. So you're constantly playing a game of who is now the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. And today's assistant, tomorrow's associate, and then after that, they're next year's uh, casting office. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, and so, now, just uh, before we move to the next question, if you sure. had to just kind of simplify your general strategy down to, like, one or two simple sentences, maybe three sentences or whatever, just kind of simplifying this whole thing down, you essentially target the casting directors that you feel like are going to be the ones who, you know, are responding best to you, essentially. And what exactly do you do when you, when you like, once the, you know that they're a target, then you start reaching out to them or whatever? So just kind of uh, clarify that part one more time for us. Step, step one is continuing to maintain my contacts with anybody with whom I've worked or who's expressed interest in my work or who's brought me in. Step two is researching always to see what associates from offices that you know have moved to new offices and targeting that office. Because you've already got a, a built-in in with that office. Targeting that office is everything from taking classes with them to um, making sure that you're in it at, you go to screenings of things that they have cast, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, researching the projects that each office is involved with and you know, you can't, if you don't have access to the breakdowns, that doesn't mean you can't find out or submit on what might be out there. There's SAG provides lists, there's all kinds of places to get you the production as to what's happening in town. And to just say, get in on the ground floor with submissions for a project early on. I don't know that you want to say, you know, like, if I'm right for anything in this, I hope you'll consider me. But I do think if you know someone in the office already, you can say, this is a, I hear you guys are working on this project, and I think it's fascinating. And I've read this book about it, or I, um, I, you know, I read the piece on which it's based. You know, and I, I'd love to have an opportunity to be seen for it when the time comes. That's it. Nothing more than that. But always remembering that you're targeting and researching in tandem. It does you no good to target people with a general question. Yeah. No, that's that's excellent. Um, and so just to to research those. Those companies and who's moving where and all that, do you typically use LinkedIn or how do you know who works where and where they're moving to? Well, actually, I, I use LinkedIn. I use Casting Call. I use all of the normal guides that you can get at Actors Connection or any of those places. And then I also follow the offices. You know, like if I've gone in for an office, I have their agency, the, the office's website. I keep that. I keep a whole file of those. Yeah. Cool, and you can be on mailing lists probably for some of them as well, and they send out yeah. newsletters from time to time. You can also you can also like their page on Facebook. You can you know it doesn't hurt you any to like the pages on Facebook to like the Instagram accounts of the companies. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you if you're constantly um, aware of what's happening in in terms of what they're doing, like my manager is constantly posting about stuff that uh, that her clients are doing, comedy shows that they're in, this thing that's going to have a big screening, whatever. It's, it's not rocket science to meet my manager. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's out there. Yeah. Um, I used to tell people when I taught at HB Studio, I used to say part of this business is just being out and about. And I would say your job this week is to meet a casting director. And there were always like half the class was new and half the class was old. And the new people, they always would come back the next week. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to do this. It's impossible. And I said, did you try going to an audition? If you went to an audition, that's meeting a casting director. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think of it like that. But the other group of the group would go like, did you try walking around the theater district? And one of the guys says, well, what good does that do? He says, you know that there's the internet. You can actually get pictures of people and see what they look like. You can walk, if, if you go down, at that time, if you went down, what street is the Helen Hayes on, 45th maybe? Um, Whatever street it is, if you walked down that street at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, any Monday through Friday, you could have a conversation with Mark Simon, who at the time was a major cast secret. He cast <laughs> all of live and all that stuff. And he did all the, he did Radio City for a long time, he did tons of things. 
But the thing was, anybody who knew him knew that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he took a set cigarette break and he'd be downstairs for 40 minutes just standing on the sidewalk smoking a cigarette. <laughs> That's awesome. I love I love how uh, you know strategic and you think everything through, and that definitely makes a difference. Um, well, if you don't, if you're not out on the street, you know, the, the, if, if you're interested in film and television, it's a little more difficult because those offices are spread all over the place. But if you're a theater-based actor, you can get off the subway at 59th Street and walk to 42nd Street and book your year because you can run into John Ware on the street. You can run into Lin Manuel Miranda coming mm-hmm. from something. You can you can actually run into people all the time. Yeah. And if you walk into any bar um, and sit down and have a drink and relax in the afternoon, and you'll see there'll be some somebody theatrical will be sitting in one of the corners or will walk in and be having a conversation. I left into um, the entire production team on Come From Away, and I had no problem walking up to them and talking to them because I knew their choreographer from a show I had done, and I knew Chris Ashley from another show. So, and I would, I didn't want anything from them. So it was lovely to be able to walk up and meet all of the producers and be able to say genuinely, I am so rooting for you guys. Your show is so amazing. And Chris and Liz, Chris and, um, oh, God, I'm right out of my head now. The, uh, the choreographers and Kelly, Chris and Kelly are amazing, and you must be so happy. I did it the other night with one of the producers on Be More Chill. She goes to the bar across the street from where I teach. It's not that I'm trying to, to become their next best friend, but next time you run into somebody, they subliminally remember you. Yeah. And you walk into her. I have walked into rooms and had a casting person say, this is, and have them say, oh, I know Eric Michael. <laughs> we were at that party out in, out in, in Bridgeport. You, oh, you're you so funny. It was, it was great. How is so-and-so? And you have a personal conversation, and it's somebody that you met casually. Because mm-hmm. yeah. the business is the business is not just contacts; it's relationships. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um. So, uh, all right. Uh, I don't know in terms of uh, timing uh, how much time you have. I know that we've been talking for a little bit about that because I still I- have a couple questions. No, I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine. This is my time off. Okay, awesome. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm good on time as well. So uh, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of your uh, goals with your acting career, uh, what would you say is like one or two of your main goals in your acting career? Um, and what are you currently doing, if anything different than you know the stuff that we've talked about? Are you doing anything different to like reach those goals or to start taking te- steps towards those goals? Okay, there are there are three. One of which has already been sort of taken care of, but you know that my knees were bad for mm-hmm. five years. Yeah, and so after I had my knees done, I decided I wanted to return to the stage and hopefully in a musical. I haven't been able to really be in anything more than like a straight play for limited scenes for almost four or five years. Um, now that my knees are good, I went, I, I decided that I wanted to do a musical. Um, I started going to EPAs in the spring for the first time in many years. And actually the first EPA I went to, I booked. So I'll be going away to do my first musical in about five years in July. And I'm going to be playing Herr Schultz in a production of Cabaret. Nice. So the, goal has now been met, but now it's carrying through with that to continue to do it. So I'm, I'm back to taking weight training into dance class and um, getting my body in the kind of shape that it can be at the age that I am so that I can take the stresses of doing a musical and having to dance or move more than, you know, a foot or two in either direction. Um, my second big goal, and I'm in the middle of it now, is I made the decision that I want to invest heavily in going into audiobooks. And uh, I actually just met with the guy who's working with me on the project last night um, in preparation. And in two weeks, we go in and we will be recording the demos that we need. I've already had a meeting with my agents about it because one of my agents handles audiobooks. But also, I'm dealing right now with um, making contact with people at Audible and with a couple of other places to have the demo and hit the ground running with it. And then the... The third goal is to move from, I do a lot of co-star roles, to move from co-stars to guest stars and recurring. Uh, my manager thinks bigger. My manager says guest stars and series regular. 
but I would right now be happy with more guest stars and more recurring. Uh-huh. Um, doesn't mean I won't do co-stars, but I am targeting more of that. So when I meet somebody, I tend not to go to how to pick a how to book a co-star class. I tend to go to classes or casting sessions that are about indie film or are about um, booking guest star roles. Um, because there's a, it's a big difference. The guest star is a big difference from the from the uh, co-star role. Because even though you know people see the word co-star, and you go like, well, that can be anything from one line to you know two scenes. It's all in what your billing was. But on your resume, it just reads co-star, 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 co-star. So the next step for me is to move beyond that and. I feel well aligned to do it. My, my, I trust my manager implicitly. We discuss what we need to discuss. And that was a big part of my decision-making process in, in pursuing this, was I went, look, I've done everything else that one can do. I'm going to go get a good manager. And I got one. Um, my agents are lovely people. Hopefully, they can affect some changes too. But I really trust uh, my manager more than anybody. Cool. Um uh, really fast, if you don't mind. Um, so, equity principal auditions, EPAs. Can you just explain to uh, the listeners and stuff, uh, just in case some actors don't know exactly what that means? Sure. Um, an equity principal audition. There, there are two kinds of equity auditions: equity principal auditions and equity chorus calls. Equity chorus calls mainly are for musicals, and you sign up and you go in uh, in by number. And you don't have time slots so much. You just get onto the list and you show up the day of the audition and they, in the order in which you signed up, you're given a number. And in groups of anywhere from 20 to 30 people, you're called, you stand and everybody walks in and does anywhere from 8 to 16 bars of music. If the music department is interested in you, they may ask for something brief in addition. But as a general rule, that's the audition. The nice thing about an equity chorus call is that someone from the music department I believe is required to be there. So you're singing for somebody who actually can do something for you. Yeah. Uh, an, an equity principal audition, technically the person in the room has to be someone with hiring ability um, or at least referring ability, but that can be a crapshoot who you're getting seen by. <laughs> um, and basically the way that works is you sign up in advance for a time slot online and if you can't get a time slot, then you must. Then you have to go to, um, on the day of the call, you have to go early in the morning and wait in line and hope to get one of the remaining non-online time slots before you become an alternate. When you go in the room, if it's a straight play, you're usually asked for one two-minute monologue or two contrasting one-minute monologues with the audition not to go exceed two minutes in length. If it's for a musical, you're generally asked for a brief selection uh that implies 32 bars but they can you can fudge that if it comes in at 90 seconds you can probably get it done um some auditions if you're auditioning for a season you might be auditioning for uh, a season that has three musicals and five straight plays in which case they will say if you want to be considered for musicals and straight plays sing 16 bars of a song and do one monologue that's under under a minute so that the whole audition is always two minutes or less these auditions are primarily pre-screens in almost every case. Uh, equity requires them. Equity producers are required to, to have them. Um, but people do get hired from them. I have been hired from EPAs, and I have many colleagues who have been hired from EPAs and from ECCs. Um, plainly, it's better if your agent gets you an appointment um, so that you're really settled and you're doing material from the show and not just your general because a lot of times you're aiming at something and you don't quite know what it is that they want. Uh, whereas when you're going to an agent, often you've seen material, you know what the themes are, uh, you have some idea what the piece is. Um, again, with all EPAs and ECCs, you should research the project. And if you can't, if it's a new play, you should research the writer, mm -hmm. find out the style in which they write, um, go in as informed as you can. Sometimes in EPA, uh, they will have you read from sides. Uh, in which case, like let's say your audition is at 2 in the afternoon, my advice is always, if you've got the time, go by equity in the morning or wherever they're holding the audition and take pictures of the sides, which are usually taped to the wall, of the ones that you want to read. And then you can study them for a couple of hours before you come back to your audition. 
Yeah. But you don't do hand instead of size until maybe 20 minutes before your audition. Um, but that, that's the basics of a union call. It, at, the, at those calls, they will often see equity membership candidates, that is, people who are accruing points toward membership. And if time permits, they will see non-union people as well. But at a lot of auditions that I've been doing this last year, um, most of the calls have said we are not seeing non-union or EMC today. So um, you have to find alternate ways to get into the room. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, I have I have a question about just auditioning. Um, what would be one or two, uh, I mean, something different, like you already mentioned earlier, like see other casting directors, but uh, what would be like one or two additional tips that you could give to an actor who struggles to get called back uh, after auditioning, either like tips for the audition itself or anything else, like people who are struggling in auditions, basically? Um, there's a bunch of things to take into consideration. The most important one is the question always is, are you reading from their material or are you auditioning with your own material? The mistake most people make when they're auditioning with their own material is they have not chosen something that is showing them off in a way that will get them work. You need to be ruthless with that. You need to, I advise, you know, to keep a list of auditions just as you would keep a list of auditions of which photograph did I submit for this job? What was I wearing the day I went into this job? I would keep a list of which, uh, which, let's say it's a monologue or a song. What did I think? What did I read that day? And if you see a monologue that you've done for a period of, let's say, six months, and it's not getting any response, like none, it might be time to question whether or not that monologue is showing you up as well as you think it is. At that point, you go to a coach and you say, take a look at this and tell me, am I just not doing it well or does it not match me? Um, because what actors have a problem doing is they often try to aim at what they think the casting people are looking for instead of aiming at who they are at their essence. And if you aim at what you are at your essence, because you might go in and be wrong for a part of the show, but you might be right for something else in the show or right for something that the casting office is doing in three months. And if they don't see you, they just see what you think they wanted to see, often they can't find you. They just can't find you in that mess. So that's, I would say that's the number one thing, is to be sure that the material you're presenting matches you as clearly as possible. And then from there, if you're, if you're going in on stuff, um, if you've got a question regarding pronunciation, if you've got a question, the true question, like um, uh, this, they didn't provide the script. Um, can you tell me what has just happened prior to this beat? I have some choices I've made, but this information might help me. Okay, those are legitimate questions, but if you're if you're going to ask questions, they're going to just take time. They're going to think you didn't prep. When somebody asks me if I have any questions, as a general rule, I will say, if you have something you want to offer, I'm happy to hear it. Otherwise, I make the choices. I'd love to show them to you, and then if you want to adjust something, great. And I do my thing. Awesome. Um, I find that to be, you know, I once did an audition for a show that I ended up booking, but I, I went in, I did my thing. They said, do you have any questions? I said, no. I said, I said given what you provided me, I made choices and let's see. And I finished it, and the, the creative team was all of the hysterics because the director stood up and he said, I'm so sorry, we're not laughing at you. It's just really, we've now realized that we should have provided proper information. Everything you did was great. It's just 180 degrees from what this scene is about. <laughs> yeah. And I said, oh. I said, okay. He said, so let me explain. I said, no. I said, that was the perfect note. I said, I can work with that. And I literally took what I had done. I just turned it on my head, on its head and went in another direction. And, uh, and I, I booked the show. That's, so, that's awesome. <laughs> sometimes people, because sometimes when people ask questions, they're not really listening for the answers. And consequently, the director may give you a very piece of important, a piece, important piece of information, and you may uh, process it in a way that doesn't indicate you heard what he said. And then you just look stupid. You just look like somebody who can't take direction. So you want to be careful about asking for help if you really don't think you need it. Now, on the other hand, I went in on something um, 
for a wonderful television directors are almost never in the room at your first call. But I went in on this one project, um, and the director was there, and the casting director had worked with me before. And they said, do you have any questions? And I said, actually, I do have one question. I said, I'm just, because I was presenting a piece of art to somebody. I said, is it the, the French or the Flemish pronunciation of this piece of art? And the director just sat there for a minute, kind of stunned, and he goes, I'm just fascinated that you know there's a difference. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, it's in the script, and I didn't know what it was, so I thought maybe I should look it up, and it's the Flemish tapestry, so the title is obviously Flemish. But in the piece, if it's hung in a museum, would the curator, you know, pronounce it in the French style, or would he be doing it in the Flemish? And he says, could I hear both? And I said, sure. So we did the scene, and I booked the job. Of course, when I got to set, they had changed the name of the piece of art entirely, so that was hilarious. <laughs> but my point is that that was a legitimate question. It engaged the director, but it also told him I had done my research, that I knew there was a difference. And it wasn't a show off the question because it, I easily could have done it with the French and he could have said, oh, the writer's not going to like that. And I might never have known. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, it, it's a balancing act with questions. It really is. Awesome. Well, that is, that is fantastic. Um, the final, uh, Actually, there's one side question, and we might have covered this a little bit earlier uh, when you were talking about how you kind of do your targeting for casting directors and everything. But just in terms of uh, advice on getting an agent, um, you know, do you have any advice for actors who are looking to get an agent? Best advice I can give anyone is ask everyone you know, you do not know, who is going to connect you. Um, I met my first agent in the city through um, my singing partner. When I chose to leave them, I left them because I had been introduced. I was working in a show, and um, one of the other stars of the show, the, his wife, was an agent. And um, she saw the show and was interested in me and brought me in. And so I went with a very strong agency for a number of years. Um, the, when I decided, when I when, when that did not continue and I moved on, um, I told, I basically I sat in my apartment uh, and thought, okay, I've got to start over here. And it was actually, you know, the business class I taught at HB. I walked into the class that day. It was starting the next. I got the note on Friday and we're starting on Monday. And I walked in. I said, so I give an assignment every year, every season. We have 10 weeks, and you have to set up a series of projects that you are going to accomplish in the next 10 weeks, and then we follow a progress board of it for 10 weeks. And um, they did their thing, and I said, okay, and I'm going to include myself this season because I am no longer with my agency, which means I am unrepresented, which means I need new pictures, I need a new website, I need, or at least adjustments to my current one, um, I need a new agent, I need a reel, a new reel, and... I will have all of this done in 10 weeks. And they were, you know, it sounded like, it sounded like I was crazy. But on the day of the 10th class, I came in and they all did their presentations and then they said, so how did you do? And I turned on my computer, I showed them the new website, I pulled up on the computer the new photos which had just come in and just been retouched, and I showed them the reel that we had just completed, which, praise the Lord, Past the ammunition has now since been redone many times because of wonderful new credits. Hmm. Um, and then I just PDF them the I PDF the email from the agency that they just offered to sign me. And I said, and I got that agent the way I told you to get an agent. I told everyone that I knew, and one of my clients who I coached and got his first Broadway show through me said, "Let me take your stuff to my agent and see what he thinks." And that's how I met him. My current agent. I met the same way. I told several friends, it's time for change. It's not going the way I want it to go. And uh, a friend that I've signed with somebody new, they're, they're very hungry. They're incredibly nice. And I think it might be a good match for them. And I met with them, and it was, it was a match. They're people that I respect and I love. Um, as with anything, you're always looking at the agency and trying to decide, is this where I'm going to stay? And I'm committed to these people, or is this a place 
place I'm going to be while I figure out if they can do what they need to do. Because you can say you have an agent who you're blue in the face, but if they can't make a phone call or get you in the door, you might as well not have an agent. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. That's a key for people is to just say, look, I, I, I want to be represented because it does help me get in. But not being represented will not keep you from getting in. You just have to redouble your efforts in terms of your contacting people and letting people know you're around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, but I do think word of mouth and personal reference is the fastest way to get an agent. And then, you know, from there, let's say... Um, uh, let, let's say that there's an, uh, last night at uh, um, a- Actors Connection, I was there for something else, but they had an agent night. There were six agents there. People mm-hmm. were doing, there were three different rooms of people, two agents in each room. And I guess they moved from room to room to room. The, um, there were three agents there that I've had the opportunity to interact with through clients of theirs over the years. I, I, if I hadn't already been committed to take it in the class, I would have almost done it even though I'm resigned, just because I would have liked to have seen what other opinions were out there. But as it happened, walking out of the room, one of my old agents was in the panel. And we stopped and we talked, and now we're going to have lunch in a couple of weeks. And I'm not saying that I would go back with her or that she would be interested in having me. I'm just saying that that that's another one of those, don't throw away your contacts. You don't know where they're going to take you. Yeah. Or how they're going to take you. And if you know, for instance, let's say... Let's say you, in my case, I teach voice, and let's say I have four students who are with um, agent X. Um, First place I would go would be to say, like, can any of you recommend me? Would any of you be willing to take my stuff in or to say something? Um, I've walked into rooms before with with agents, and they said, oh, I know your name. You're on my client's so-and-so list. And don't you know that agent has called my client and said, what's he like? You know, and that's gotten you in, that gets you interviews because it's all people saying, yeah, you'd like working with him. He's a good one. You can ask if you've worked with a casting director that you feel you have rapport with. And I don't mean a casting director that you've met in a class. I'm talking about somebody who's hired you, someone with whom you have a relationship. Um, there was a casting director in Todd Taylor's office a long time ago who's now a very big casting director, but he was one of the first casting directors ever to give me a list of agents and say, if nobody responds from your submission, tell me and I'll make calls. Casting, you know, a casting agent can get you, a casting director can get you into an agent's office because they're saying, right off the bat, they're saying, um, I hire this person. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, this is the door. You don't have to beat down. Yeah. Um, I just have one really quick clarification question. At the very sure. beginning, when I had asked you the question, you said, first off, tell everyone you know or ask everyone you know, um, you know, in regards to the agent. But my, my question was just for clarification on what do you mean by ask everyone you know? Like, what, what do you actually say to people? Um, I think you're pretty blunt. You say, hey, you know what? I'm between agents right now. If you know anybody who's taking people on? Do you have any references? Anybody you can, you know, anybody that you can connect me with? Mm-hmm. I, there's no shame in it, you know. Yeah. And and when I say ask everyone you know, I literally mean that. I have a friend of mine who's a big attorney in a major firm, and his wife is just she's just a, a socialite, but she's friendly with a lot of people. And um, this friend of mine happened to be at a party with her, and she was saying, "And what do you do?" She said, "Well, I'm an actress, but you know, I." I'm between agents right now, and she says, oh, she says, you should meet my friend so-and-so. She would love you. And my friend says, oh, well, I would, that would be wonderful. Can you help me do that? She says, oh, don't be silly. I'll do it right now. She's right over there. <laughs> so she walked her over, introduced her, and said, this is so-and-so, and she's a friend of my friend Eric Michaels, and if he likes her, then she's brilliant, and so you should talk to her. And... They had a glass of wine together, and they chatted for a while. The girl was really smart. She didn't overplay it because it was a social situation. But she said, may I have permission to give you a call this week and, and continue the conversation? And the agent said, you know what? Let me think about it, and I'll call you. Give me your card. And so the girl gave her a card and trusted it. And three days later, she got a phone call. 
That's cool. That's uh, that's really, really good because those are the types of specifics, you know, that you don't really hear. Like there's, you know, people will run either classes or post info and articles online and it's like, ask, you know, ask people, you know, and, and you're kind of like, well, what does that mean? And having those very specific things, like you just explained that story, makes it a lot easier for an actor to understand like, oh, okay, I get it now, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you think, well, I'm only going to ask the people that I know who are actors. Well, you know, if you're going to target only actors, then you're limiting yourself. If directors work with agents all the time. Casting people work with agents all the time. Every creative in the business knows somebody who knows an agent. Yeah. And, and, and then, like I say, in this particular case, this couple, they're not connected to the business at all. Mm -hmm. totally. But they happen to be friends with somebody who is. Yeah. You know, so you just don't know if you, if you if you're not willing to ask for it, then the answer from the universe is always going to be no. Mm -hmm. Totally, um, that's awesome. My uh, my final section is just on uh, your general uh, overall advice. So, like, um, if you had to pick like one or two things uh, that you've done in your career to promote yourself. Um, like, out of all the different things that you tried and everything, you kind of narrowed it down to, like, one or two top things that you think have been the most helpful in moving your acting career forward. Which, or what would those be? First is rebranding. And I don't mean in that negative sense of rebranding. I mean reimagining what it is that I'm selling. Mm -hmm. um, the example that I would use would be, like, if, if, I'm, if I'm bored with oatmeal, and I don't want to buy oatmeal anymore, but then I walk in and somebody's got oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins in it and I don't have to bother with it, I can just have that. I'm more inclined to buy that product. And the actor is no different. You're, you, you pass through phases of your career, you know, you know, you're a juvenile, then you're hopefully a lead, then you're a character, and then you're elderly. And all along that process, you have to look and say, well, what are the opportunities that are greatest for someone at this point in time? Um, in my 50s, I would say television became a big thing for me because there were so many parts for senators and judges and doctors. And, you know, I have a reel that I use. It's called, you know, Eric Michael Gillette, Judges, Corrupt and Otherwise. And it's just one-liners of me as judges on every show you can imagine, just, you know, either being a jerk or being nice, but always a judge. Um, it, the, the, things that I have found the most useful have been taking a good solid look at the materials that I'm using to submit. So uh, an example would be I had a photograph that I loved that I used for many years. Um, I spoke to the agents I was with at the time. I said, I think we're not getting what we want. And they said, I said, maybe I should get new photos. They said, we love this picture. Everybody loves this picture. Remember the story I told you about the girl who was auditioning for people and she never got called in? Yeah. Okay, same thing. In my head, what they said didn't make sense. In my head was, you're submitting this picture over and over again, and everybody says, oh, what a cute picture, and you really love this picture, but it's not getting any results. That means it's the wrong picture. Mm -hmm. So I did, for the first time ever, I rethought how I wanted to be seen, and I had my I had a set of photos done. First time I've ever done it, I seven pictures. This is before I knew you. Mm -hmm. um, I had... I let my hair grow out, my beard grow out, and I started from there. I had what I called the Dick Nolte East Village burnt out artist photo. I had the the uh, cynical detective on the homicide squad photo. I had the sleazy professor photo. Um, I had the the hot young businessman, you know, eager beaver in the office, still moving up the corporate ladder. There were seven of them, and I said, start using these. We started getting auditions almost immediately. And the reason was, was because you could actually look at the picture and say, oh, yes, I see him in this part. Yeah. Whereas my other picture, everybody liked it, and it looked great, but it was it was a generic me. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, flash forward, after using those mixed images for about three years, I reverted to a single shot again. Because by that time, a lot of the casting people I had been targeting knew me. So I didn't have to send a different picture. Interesting. So rebranding becomes a, a major part of what you do. And the other thing is that I would say is the most important thing if you want to get your career forward is get content. I can't tell you how many casting people complain now 
they, they want to, they're looking at someone, they meet someone in an audition, they hear, they see someone in a class, whatever, and they go to look them up and they can't find any content online. You, it's a singer who doesn't have any music online, it's an actor who has no scene, no reel, no nothing, and there's too many ways to create and get content now that, that that's not excusable and you have to have it. Because content is, that's what's going to get you work. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So the, the rebranding or really looking at your brand and making sure your materials represent you and secondarily making sure your content is up to date and up to snuff. I would say those are the two top suggestions for getting stuff to move again. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, so that, uh, that answers that question perfectly, which is if you had to give some advice to an actor who's stuck at a plateau in their career – they would want to look at those two primary things as a starting place and then, you know, kind of continue if they've already done those things and they're really good, they look at other stuff. But to finish up, is there anything else that you would like to say to an actor um, who might be listening to this and is really looking for something that could help them move forward or, you know, maybe they're feeling like, discouraged because they're feeling stuck or whatever, you know, anything that you would want to say, uh, you know, before we wrap this up? Um, I was introduced to a very short book that was written, I think, in 1912 um, by a career coach last year. And by the way, I highly recommend if you're really stuck, call a career coach or take a class with someone like you, not to shill for you, but because <laughs> what you need sometimes are other points of view. Totally. Um, but I... I took a, I took a, a, what I would call a career coach on for about nine months, and among the things that she required me to do were goal list, you know, going back to the basics, goal listing, stuff like that. But the most important thing she introduced me to was a book called As a Man Thinketh, and mm-hmm. you can get that book online. It's like 30 pages long. It's free. It's been around forever. The language is a little archaic. It's maybe a little higher power based for some people. But the principle behind the book is that our thoughts are seeds. And if you're planting a garden with nothing but thorns, you can't be surprised when you grow thorns. If you're planting a garden with beautiful things, you shouldn't be surprised when beautiful things grow. So the idea behind the book is that fill your head with, not, I, I hate to kind of very very but with positive thoughts, but beware the negative thoughts. You know, just look out for when you're saying, you know, I can't do this, or this is not going to work, or I'm so angry today at that person. Throw that away. It's useless time. Useless energy. Look mm-hmm. for what you feel good about you. Look for what you feel good about your career, and do three things every day for your career. Just just for your career. Just forget about the things that you want to do for you, like the little Manny Petty or going out for a cocktail with friends. Just three simple things that could be done in 20 minutes. Even if it's like a quick phone call or a text to somebody or, you know, go look at a new, if you're thinking about photos, go look at a new photographer's website. Just three simple things that you can point to at the end of the day and say, I did nothing else today, but I did this. Nice. And believe it or not, it does change your point of view. It, it really does. This book was, it, it was invaluable to me. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, this was fantastic. Um, you know, I want to, on behalf of everybody listening to this, uh, and definitely myself, thank you a lot for your uh, time and your, you know, generous sharing of all of these really cool stories and things that have happened in your career, and you know, different people that you've had the opportunity to meet. Uh, all of this stuff, when people listen to this, um, you know, I'm going to be trying to transcribe it and, and have it posted and stuff as useful strategies for people to follow. But all of this, I think they're going to find it really, really fascinating and helpful. So I want to really thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.